Good morning, everyone. Ah, good. You are there. This morning, you and I are going to take a ride, travel, go to Africa, visit a small nation called Rwanda in the heart of Africa. But before this, I would like to give you a hint. Rwanda is a small country, as I said, located in the heart of Africa between the giant Congo, Burundi, Tanzania, and Uganda. In Rwanda, we are three ethnic groups. We are Hutus, 85%, Tutsis, 14 and Batwa, just 1%. You do never hear about them because they do not talk as much as we do. <laughs> Many times, people ask themselves, why a nation like Rwanda can be so divided? Why can people hate each other that much? I will tell you that Rwandans do not hate themselves, each other, that much. But our main problem has ever been the bad leadership. And of course, this leadership has kept on dividing the nation since even colonization. We many times tend to blame colonizers, but when colonizers came in, Hutus were slaves to Tutsis. Of course, they took advantage of the divisions and divided us much more for them to conquer. They went as far, of course, as even measuring noses, saying that those with longer noses, with who, those who are a little bit thin and tall, are supposed to be Tutsis, and others are supposed to be Hutus. They are kind of artificial, artificial divisions. With these divisions, in 1959, when Hutus took over from Tutsis, when colonizers were also leaving, Tutsis fled the country. At that time, about 250,000 Rwandans, Tutsis, unfortunately, had to flee the country. And when they fled the country, they went to refugee camps. A refugee camp is a place where I wouldn't wish any one of you to, to be or even to see. But you have to see only for a learning a lessons, for learning lessons so that you have an idea of how people can be frustrated, of how people can suffer. It is a place where you don't have, you don't have a shelter, where you don't have running water, where you, where you don't have food, where there are no schools, like this one today, where many of you young people are attending. Those people who fled Rwanda went to many different neighboring countries. Most of them went to Uganda, Burundi, the Congo, and also a few to Tanzania. Their children for generations were not attending schools, as I told you. And these people kept on being frustrated. Even the ones who stayed in the country were also frustrated. To go to school, you had to be among the few lucky ones, 14% to be chosen and go to, to attend the secondary school. In 1972, there is another genocide that took place, and the whole world kept quiet. They never talk about it. This was in Burundi, where the Tutsi army, because there was that kind of hatred between Hutus and Tutsis in both countries, Burundi and Rwanda are twin countries. We, all of us in both countries, speak the same language. 
Kinyarwanda and Kirundi are the same languages, but they call it Kirundi in Burundi and we call it Kinyarwanda and Rwanda. We share the same culture in both countries. We are the same people in the same percentages, Hutus and Tutsis and Batwa in both countries. So Burundi was ruled by Tutsis and Rwanda by Hutus. In 1972, the Tutsi army killed, as I said, approximately 200,000 Hutus on the streets of Bujumbura. You can read this in a book written by Ambassador Kruger, who was the senator for many years, the senator and congressman of, the, of Texas in this country. His book is entitled From Bloodshed to Hope in Burundi. It came out in October last year, a few months ago. So when, to, when Hutus were frustrated in Burundi, they fled to Rwanda. And yet, Tutsis had fled Rwanda, going to Burundi in 1959-60, and so on. This ended up happening in Rwanda again in 1972-73. And we went as far as saying that whatever happens in Rwanda always end up happening in Burundi, but the other way around. In 1988, again, and other, many other massacres took place in Burundi, in Nega, in Nega and Marangara, when, again, the army killed many people in Burundi, in those regions of Nega and Marangara, and Hutus again fled to Rwanda. To make, work, to make the situation worse, in 1990 then, those refugees who had fled Rwanda since 59, 60, 73, and so on. They had been training in, in Uganda, in the Ugandan army, and they attacked, they, took, they fought, they started fighting for their rights in their own country. Fighting for their rights, that was a right. Because for many years, they had been, they had been prevented from their rights. Someone was occupying, was just take, uh, having their rights, they were in exile for three decades. They had the right to fight. But unfortunately, those people who had been frustrated as refugees for three decades, when they started fighting on the hills of Byumba and Rohingya in northeastern Rwanda provinces, they also started killing innocent civilian Hutus this time. And this made the situation between Hutus and Tutsis, again, much more worse. By 1993, a Hutu president was democratically elected in Burundi in June and killed on October 23rd, 1993, the same year, four months later. Then there was a lot of tension. And even the peace agreement of Arusha between Rwandese Hutus of Rwanda and, and, uh, and Tutsis who were in exile were never implemented because the then president became very reluctant. He did not want to implement the peace agreement. Six months later, this was April 6, 1994. It was a Wednesday evening at 8.30 when we heard missiles hitting his plane. Just like any one of you, for sure, all of the audience here remember where they were on September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers were completely destroyed. I also remember where I was that day. I was at the diplomat having dinner with my brother-in-law, Thomas, and his wife, Firenze, as people have seen them in the movie Hotel Rwanda. We were sharing dinner. And my wife, who did not join us, because she had worked late and couldn't join us for dinner, she heard the missiles hitting the plane when it was trying to land and killing both presidents, Hutu presidents of Rwanda and Burundi. She immediately took a phone, called me, and told me that, listen, Paul, 
We have heard something we have never heard before. Please, rush and come back home. I immediately stood up with my brother-in-law. I remember crossing the parking, joining our cars, and shaking their hands. And this was the last time in life. Because they went their way, I went my way. They were killed and never found. But fortunately, we happened to find their two daughters, Anais and Karin, who were very young, as compared to the kids who play them in Hotel Rwanda. Anais was two years and three months, and her sister was just 11 months. We happened to find them, as you saw them in Hotel Rwanda, just in a refugee camp towards the end of the three months of the genocide. Today, they are lovely girls who go to school not far from Boston, about 25 miles away from Boston, with my younger son, who is more or less their age. They are also our daughters. This was, was the beginning of an endless massacre and a genocide. Many times, young people, and I believe this question, you are not going to ask it to me again, always ask me, why? Why did you decide to risk your life and do what you did? I will tell you that myself, I never took that decision. Today, I'm in a place which is supposed to be a holy place, where you people of God are today gathered. I will tell you that someone, somewhere, God took the decision for me. Because I did not do this only in the hotel, already on day one, when we got up and looked all around us, many of our neighbors had been killed. I remember my son going on to see a son of a neighbor who was his friend. And when he arrived, he noticed that his friend, his six sisters, the mother, and two neighbors had all of them been slaughtered and were lying just down there on the compound. Many of them not yet completely dead. That boy came back running, went to his room where he stayed for four days without talking to anyone. But in the meantime, many neighbors were coming to my house one by one, just joining one by one, coming to me. You will ask me, why did they come to my house? I don't have any answer. I do not know why they decided to come to my house. But this is what was happening. By the end of the day, I had 26 neighbors who had come to stay with us. And when I got an opportunity to be evacuated from the house to the hotel, that was on day three of the genocide, I had no other choice than taking them to the hotel at my own risk. I remember we drove from my house in a mile away not at the hotel compound, as people have seen in Hotel Rwanda, but just a mile away, as described in an ordinary man. I saw the soldiers, the 20 soldiers, who had come to evacuate us in two jeeps. I saw the jeep which was ahead of us, slowing down, stopping, asking me also to stop. And I stopped. My neighbor who was also driving behind me, I saw him now also stopping after me in the other jeep, also stopping. We stopped. And those guys who previously were very lovely, very good in their language, I saw them just each and everyone jumping from his jeep, his gun on my head, telling me that, listen, you traitor, you are lucky. We are not killing you today because the new government has sent us to pick, up, to pick you up from, this, from your house and bring you to the hotel. 
We need you. But have this gun and kill all of you cockroaches in these cars. In such a situation, what would you say? As the vice president has just said, words can be the best or the worst weapon in the human being's arsenal depending on what goal or objective we want to achieve. That time, for I knew those guys were not joking because all along the street, there were many dead bodies, some of them missing their heads, others' bellies opened, mutilated. For five minutes, I stayed speechless, just watching the young captain who was leading the team. And after five minutes of watching him, and sometimes him trying to get away from my sight, I told him that my friend, myself, I do not know how to use guns. And I was very sincere. Even today, I'll tell you that I do not know how to handle a gun. But even if I knew, I told him, I do not see any reason why I should have killed those people. Sometimes, when we deal with the people, we have to look to, put, to come down and deal with them on their own ground. I just told him that, my friend, I came down and, no, to, uh, to their own ground. And I told them that, my, listen, my friends, I do understand you. You guys are hungry. You guys are thirsty. You guys are tired. You are stressed with this, by this war. I do understand you. Even if you don't understand, you have to find a way. You have to open up a kind of window. And then I told them that, listen, you guys, since I do understand you, we can, I can assure you, we can find other solutions. I pointed out a young lady who was holding her baby. The baby was three months old. I pointed out Grace, that, was, that is her name, because she is still alive, and said, I told them, are you sure, my friends, that this baby is the real enemy we are fighting today? Are you sure that this old man, there was an old man, are you sure that this old man is the right enemy we are fighting today? Then we started to deal. We started to find other solutions. And immediately, I proposed, I proposed them another solution. And the other solution was to give them money to feed them. I proposed to feed them, to give them money to go and buy food. And we came up after two long hours, not, not a minute or two, as people have seen on the screen, we came up with an agreement. I'll tell you this, and believe you me, whoever opens his or her mouth and is willing to discuss with you, you will always come up with an agreement. You will always come up with a compromise depending on how you deal with the situation. After two long hours, we came up with an agreement. They drove us up to the hotel. I went to my office, to the safe, got cash, and paid them because I had promised. I paid them, and that, that, that day, I had learned the most but I had dealt with evil, if you want. But I had learned the most important lesson I have ever learned in my life. I had dealt, I had learned how to deal with the evil in such evil times. And this lesson is the one which was going to help me throughout my stay in the Mikulin Hotel. I first of all went to the Diplomat Hotel for three days, because the, gov the government, the new government, which was put up, put up on April 9th, had decided to take over my, ho my hotel and 
kick out all the refugees who were inside. And immediately, I went there and stayed with them for three days. After three days, I remember it was on the 12th of April, 1994, at 6.30 a.m., when I just was moving as usual, as a routine, and noticed that all the members of the government were gathering everything, throwing everything in their cars, including hotel property, blankets, berry sheets, and pillows. I said, oh, well, these guys are leaving. I immediately went upstairs, told my wife that let us join these guys because they are leaving. They immediately came down, and we joined the convoy, drove until the Mikolin. And when we arrived at the Mikolin Hotel, I turned left and got into the Mikolin Hotel. And this is the place where we were going to stay for another 76 no, 70 days. That is where we're going to stay for another 70 days in a kind of small sanctuary which was located in a big, a small island of peace, if I can call it this way, located in a big sea of fire. When I arrived there, there was no security at all around the hotel. And yet, we had about 400 refugees already inside. And the Mikolin manager had left the previous day. And when he left, because Mia had left Mikolin one and a half years before, in, in November 1992, that is when I moved from the Mikolin and went to the diplomat as a general manager. So I was no more in that unit. I had to come only for refugees. The diplomat, my hotel, was evacuated by the, gov by the government, and the army was taking over the hotel. And me, I had to go to the Mikolin where we had refugees, because they are the ones who needed help. And both hotels belonged to our same company, the Sabina Corporation, a Belgian corporation, a Belgian company. So when I arrived, there was no security. And when I arrived, the hotel had about 400 refugees. My main challenge, my main challenges actually were two. One of them was to get security for the hotel, and the second one was to gain my authority back. In order to gain security, I had no choice. Then phoning all the generals I knew in the country, sometimes I could call someone who had been killed. Many other times I could, have, uh, I could, I could phone someone who had been dismissed. Many other times, someone who was no more in the office but on the war. But at the end of the day, I had five policemen, five gendarmes, who came to protect the hotel and stayed for, a program, for until the end, actually, for the whole period. They, they stayed at the hotel until the end. Life became so difficult that my hotel, but also, first of all, I had also to get the keys, all the keys. Because when my colleague fled the hotel, he, he just took the keys, the hotel keys, and threw them to the hotel employees. And this is why you see a character called Gregoire. Gregoire is a composite character, portraying all of those employees who were actually against me because I was coming to take over from them. And when Bick left, when he was evacuated, on the 11th, in the evening at 5, he, when he gave them the keys, they went to the cellars, took the best champagne, the best wine, the best of everything, and started celebrating. So I had come to prevent them from celebrating. You will understand then the reason why they were not really very happy to welcome me as such. But I, I had to deal with the security and afterwards deal with the kids and also ended up getting them from my bosses in Brussels. Life became very difficult. The hotel was attacked many times and I never kept quiet. I never shut my mouth. 
I had, I was attacked many times. I went to sleep, for instance, on April 23rd in the night. I went to sleep at 4. I had spent my, night, my day and night phoning, sending faxes whenever I couldn't phone and talk to someone, sending faxes all over the world. I was disturbing the White House, the Elysee in Paris, Brussels. I was disturbing the United Nations. I was calling the Peace Corps. Everyone I knew and people I never knew. I felt relieved talking, speaking to someone and disturbing each and everyone. That night, I went to sleep at four and was woken up by, another, by, by soldiers with an order from the Ministry of Defense telling me that, sir, are you the manager of the hotel? I said, yes. If you are the manager, an order from the, from the Ministry of Defense, get out all of these people who are in this house within 30 minutes. 6.30 in the morning was a half past midnight in Washington, D.C., and New York. It was 6.30 in Paris and Brussels in most of Western countries. So I had no one to disturb in the West. The only choice I had that day was to call only the acquaintances, those guys I knew in the army, or those generals. I started then charming those soldiers telling them that, listen, you guys, all of these people who are here are refugees. If I tell them to go, I'll be telling them that they are going where? Who is taking them? How is he taking them? What kind of security has been organized? They told me, you tell them to go as they came. In Kenya, Rwanda, it meant what it meant. You tell them to go wherever they want. We do not care that it what it means. I said, okay, now I have understood your message, but please give me rather 30 minutes so that I can at least dress. It is, two, it is six, it is the morning. I was given my 30 minutes and I looked all around the hotel. The hotel was surrounded by militia men in militia uniforms, by soldiers. And some soldiers were already on the compound within the hotel. I said to myself, that this is the end now. In my life, I'm never desperate. But that time, for the first time, I was desperate. But this was not the end. Whenever we think that this is the end, I'll let you know that it is never the end. God always has good ways to save his people. I started phoning again, calling the generals I knew. And before the end of my 30 minutes, I saw the assistant general chief of staff of the, the police on the hotel compound. I was relieved that day because that guy that day saved my life, saved our lives. Many times, as I can tell you, the hotel was attacked. And this, when, as time went on, we were losing hope. But I do not never lose hope. There is always a solution. I remember it was, on, it was on June the 17th, very early in the morning, I learned that militia men were killing refugees in a neighboring church, the St. Famille Church, which is about 500 meters away from the hotel. From the hotel rooms upstairs, you can see what is going on on the church compound. So I learned that morning that militia men were killing people in that church. And I immediately took my phone again and started calling the international community and all the people I knew and all over the world. When I was calling, I saw the mayor outside there. And when I saw him, I just ran very fast, went to meet him. And I started t telling him that, sir, you are the right person, in the right place, in the right time. I need to reinforce security around this house. I need soldiers. I need policemen. I know what is going on in the church. And I know that after the church, it will be the Mikolin Hotel. He just looked at me and told me that, listen, Paul, I don't have soldiers. 
Other soldiers are fighting. Others are taking care, are protecting official buildings. I was very bitter, very angry that day against him. I looked at him and told him that, sir, all of this you and I see today will one day come to an end. And that very day of the end, you and I, we will both have to face history. Imagine, think, if that day of the end was today, and you and I facing history, is this the right answer we will give to history? I was very rude. I was offending him. He then looked at me for a few seconds, and I saw him turning his back and joining his bodyguards, getting into his jeep, leaving the hotel. That day, I lost hope. I had just lost hope. I stayed standing alone outside there and just admiring, admiring dead flowers under the sun of June 1994. And when I had lost, I was just going to lose hope completely. I remembered that I had an appointment with his boss, General Bizimungu. Who is General Bizimungu? His General Bizimungu, as you have seen on the screen, that those are his names. And he was the general chief of staff of the army. And the way you saw it in Hotel Rwanda, the way it is, it is described in an ordinary man, is the way it happened. So I had an appointment, appointment with him at the, at the diplomat hotel, where I had to go and, get, and supply him with a few things here and there. I went to meet him. And when I was standing with him at the diplomat cellars, that is when I was informed that after killing 150 people in the church, militia men were coming up, running to my hotel, ready to kill my people. I immediately told him that, General, let us go down to the Mikolin Hotel. We immediately, without him opposing me, we immediately went to the hotel. And when we arrived, militia men had broken had broken into the hotel. They had broken many doors, starting from mine, because I was the protector of cockroaches, of the most wanted people. So they had gathered many people downstairs around the swimming pool, around the, ho the hotel swimming pool. And they were still gathering many others. I remember General Bizimungu himself telling one of his bodyguards that you certain go up there, tell all the militia men who are in this house that whoever kills someone, I'm killing him. Whoever will beat someone, I'll kill him. Whoever will remain in this house for the next five minutes, I'll shoot him. Immediately, he went up and down and removed those guys. Again, for many times, he had saved our lives. Immediately, the deciders gathered in the afternoon and decided to evacuate all of us and take us to a place which was supposed to be safer. They came to me in the evening of, of June the 17th at around 5.30 as it was the case on May 3rd. And they told me that they wanted to evacuate everybody. I looked at them and reminded, reminded them a sad experience we had had on May 3rd when we tried to evacuate the people and they were stopped in an ambush, almost killed and escaped by luck and advised to reinforce security for the night and evacuate us the following morning. And they listened to me the following morning we were all of us evacuated and taken to a different place. That was a kind of life. When we went to the rebels' side, we thought that was supposed to be safe. But again, many men were being invited for meetings and killed. Many young people were being recruited in the Truth Rebels' army and then killed. 
Many times we say that all of those men and young men, the men who have been invited for meetings, ironically we say that they are still attending meetings and one day they'd be back. Many of those young people who were again killed, we always think that, we always say ironically that they are still fighting and they would be one day back. That was the Rwandan genocide. In three months, approximately a million people were killed. You can never grasp a million people in a country like Rwanda, which was seven million people. A million out of seven meant approximately 15% of the population. Compare this to America. In America, you are about 300 million people. Imagine if someone can kill 15% of American people, and what would the world do? Would the world close its eyes, turn backs, close ears, and refuse to, to, to listen? Ladies and gentlemen, young people today, my message is despite what happened, is a message of hope. It's a message to you young people who are our future is a message to stand up and raise awareness. For so long, we stood by. Today, my message is to ask you to stand up. To stand up and do whatever you can to save the situation in the whole world, especially in the whole of Africa. The African continent, most of it, is burning. A few years ago, about two years ago, I went to Darfur, where about two million and a half people had been, had been displaced. 3,000 villages had been destroyed. More than 250,000 people had been killed. And again, the whole world closed, closed eyes and ears. In northern Uganda, 1.8 million people are displaced within that area of the world. And again, we have closed our ears and eyes, and we have turned our backs and pretend that Uganda is a safe part of this world. In the Congo, since 1996, when the Rwandan army broke into the country and killed 200,000 Rwandan refugees who had fled to that country. To date, according to the UN report, more than 5 million people have been killed, and again, we do not say any single word. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, especially you young people, I would tell you that this world, this world, if you don't stand up, will fail as it has failed always. It is you, our hope. It is you, tomorrow's leaders. You are the future of this world. And my message today is to you, young people, stand up and shape the world. Do you want this world to be a better world? It will. Do you want it to remain as it is? It will. My message today to you, stand up. We have stood by for so long. Let us all together, hand in hand, stand up. Thank you.